Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Talking Balax podcast. I am Jack, joined once again by Ewan. How are you? Hello, mate. mate. How are you? Oh, all good. All good. How are you? Busy day for us today, hasn't it? I know. Uh, we've both been all over the shop today. Ewan's not long got back from Hadrian's Wall. That's why he's a bit red. And okay. I have just finished coaching my girls' football team uh, at a tournament. We are now officially the fifth best team in the county, which doesn't sound that good. No trophies for fifth, but out of about 45 teams that entered the competition at the start of the year, I'll take it. Um, but yeah, we are joined, as you can see, those of you watching on YouTube and those of you on Spotify won't be able to see, but we are joined by, I'm, I'm sure you won't mind me saying this, a bit of a controversial figure, but a, an overall very, very successful figure. We're joined by former Leicester City CEO, Barry Pierpoint tonight. Barry, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. And thank you for inviting me along. Very kind no, of you. Thank you very much for, for coming to join us. Honestly, it's, it's it's a big privilege. Anyone who has been involved in football clubs and been involved in the world of football is welcome on this podcast anytime. So thank you so much for giving up your uh, your evening to uh, to come and see us. I'm a little bit disappointed, though, Barry. I was really hoping to see a, um, a pair of the Elton John specs. No, no, they've all gone. They, they died about 20 years ago. <laughs> I had about 13, 14 pairs of different coloured different coloured glasses and the frames are all different colours. They all match the ties, the underpants, the socks and everything else. So oh. that's all gone now. I'm a bit more sort of stable and a bit more sort of um, <laughs> regular. <clears throat> the late 80s, early 90s were a very different time. I can't say I've ever matched, I've never put, a, I've never matched a, a facial accessory to my underpants before. So that's a... Uh... Oh yes, I did. I had <laughs> all, all to match. Socks, underpants, ties, shirts, glasses, the lot. How oh. about that? We're talking about coordinators, eh? Well, it's all, it's all part of the daily routine. I'm sure about. I'm sure of that. Uh, so, I, I was quite lucky. I mean, I'll be honest. Um, one thing I'm learning uh, the hard way in in life and through this podcast is, uh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I, my, my, I was very lucky. My um, my stepfather Andrew was lucky enough to meet Barry at a Leicester Rotary evening when he was doing a speech a, a speech about his book. And it is uh, this book just here, which I've got a copy of, uh, which is Minding My Own Football Business. It's basically the story of Barry's time at Leicester. And the very successful period for the club in the 90s, prior to the last sort of nine years, probably the most successful period for, for a lot of people. Um, obviously, you co-authored it with Matthew Mann, correct? Well, it's Matthew who approached me to do it. I mean, I, yeah. I never thought about writing a book in all my life. I'm too busy. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of, you know, but that book, I, I read through it over the last couple of weeks. Um, really, really interesting. Obviously, as a fan, like you kind of see everything from the outside, but getting the inside sort of, information and the way that the club was kind of revolutionized during that period it's really really interesting to see as a fan so that's that's kind of what we're going to dive into a little bit tonight and maybe some of the some of the uh, as i said at the start some more controversial sides of things which i'm sure everybody wants to hear but we'll we'll see we'll see how it goes so uh yeah we'll, we'll dive straight into it then ewan off, okay so away. what have you been up to lately barry what's been going on what's been happening in your life Oh, gosh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> well, uh, besides, um, I'm not in football anymore. Um, I do actually have a football business. I publish other autobiographies for former football players. It's called Morgan Lawrence, and Matthew Mann and I are the owners of that business. So we publish autobiographies for former professional football players and managers. Um, I'm also a business consultant um, for various people. I'm also a borough councillor in Lincolnshire, where I live. Um, and I do other things in between. So I have been quite busy. Do you miss, do you miss the football? Just mentioning, obviously, saying that you're not in football. Do you miss it? Um, I, I enjoyed my time in it. I had about 14, 15 years in football. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I came out of it, went into advertising, marketing and PR in, in that business. And then eventually became a business consultant. And I started the publishing firm uh, in COVID times. But... Um, I think football's moved on. You, in your life, you will find, both of you, that you go through phrases and periods of time where something fits, you enjoy it, but then as time moves on, um, I mean, 15 years of Saturdays, every Saturday's working, Sunday's tired out, Monday to Friday, 12, 14-hour days, that, that's great, and I enjoy the time. I think today, football's different. It's moved on a lot. It's a lot more money involved. It's a different scenario now. And I think that, um, you know, I enjoyed the sort of spot of 15 years I did. And I think I wouldn't want to go back into it now. It's a different it's a different ball game. Mm. Yeah, you worked at, obviously, what we want to talk mostly about tonight, obviously, 
is your time at Leicester, of course. Um, but you worked at Bradford, uh, Portsmouth, Boston United. Like, what was it that kind of drew you into that world in the first place? Like, how did you end up getting into the business of football? Well, that's quite strange, really, because um, I lived, I mean, I was born in Nottingham, but I lived in Somerset at the time, and I wanted to get back to the Midlands or the East Midlands, where I came from. I'd been in Somerset for four or five years as a, in a business consultancy in the motor industry. And um, I was just missing the East Midlands, and the Somerset's a bit different to the East Midlands, a bit rural, and people spoke quite funny, you know, morning bar, how are you, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, it was a bit, and if you wanted to get a plumber or electrician, it took about three months for something to turn up. It was a bit slow for me and a bit sort of backward, and not being horrible, but in, in the sense of compared to how the, the East Midlands ticked quite fast and furious and uh, but Somerset was a bit more quiet and a bit more slower and stiller. So I wanted to get back in there. And somebody said, Leicester City is looking for a, a, a marketing director or director of marketing. Um, and um, I was told to apply, and I did. Um, There's about 250, 260 applicants. Um, and um, I was quite amazed that I, I went through a journey of about four or five interviews from September right up till the April. Uh, you read it in the book where... Um, by the time after about a third or fourth interview, I'd had enough and I went to work for top rank because I'd messed about so much by Leicester City. Mm. And I met all these different directors. And to be honest, um, they didn't know what a marketing director was or did. Um, some of them had very strange ideas. One, one chap said that um, the chairman at the time was a guy called Terry Shipman. He said, you've come for the salesman's job. Well, a salesman's one thing, a marketing director's another. Yeah. And I just said to him, uh, well, the marketing director is different to a salesman. He said to me, "It's the same thing." And did and I said, "No, it's not." You know, and um, it was it was going. You know, it, that's how it went. And anyway, I then thought I can't really go for this organisation. It's very old fashioned. The directors are a bit old fashioned. The club was dirty, and the old Filbert Street was scruffy. And I thought, no. And somebody approached me to go and work for Top Rank. So I went there for about well, just about. Um, to start with them. And then Leicester City announced in the Leicester Mercury, and I've still got the the, the piece, I think it's in that book as well, mm -hmm. um, where Leicester City announced me as their marketing director, because what happened was the, the vice chairman at the time had rang up and said, come on, we want you to join us. I said, well, you've been messing me about for six months. And I've got another job. <laughs> I said, well, we, we, we're going to announce you. I said, well, no, 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 I, I'm not coming. Anyway, they announced it. And my boss lived in Melton Mowbray at um, top rank, and he fired me on the basis I wasn't yeah. to, going to start there. Well, I just started there and I, he told me to, you know, get stuffed. So I, I got stuffed and I went back to Leicester and that's how I got there. <laughs> it's a very strange story. Yeah. I mean, I was, yeah, yeah, I was, I was good. We were going to ask you that later on. I've literally got here the notes. I've put the, tell us the story about how uh, you nearly ended up unemployed. But yeah, that's, it's, it's incredible. Isn't it? like, I mean, I've, you talk about the club being a bit of a mess now. I mean, that's that's, that's shocking. Isn't it? It's like you, you've you've upset another job, and then they announce it without <laughs> announcing it. That's, well, the oh. strange thing was, I got two letters of, of two letters of appointment. One was for thirty five grand, and one was for thirty. So I took the thirty five grand one. And I thought, oh, you, you would, would <laughs> obviously, yeah. Two different chairmen, Terry Shipman and Martin George, offered me the same job, a different amounts of money. So I took I took the larger amount, and I, that's how I started on the April the second, nineteen ninety one. Yeah. <clears throat> what, a, what a journey that was six months of being messed about and then get there by default you know well to be fair sometimes you you fall, you fall upwards sometimes don't you but well i'm six foot six i suppose i do <laughs> <laughs> lucky for some lucky for some barry um do you think the on-field performances under david pleat helped you land a job well, I didn't really meet I didn't really meet David Pleat to be honest. I mean, I, I, the, one of the reasons why they were I was told I was being messed about was because David Pleat was they was trying to find a way of, of removing David Pleat, and they wanted to get rid of David Pleat before they brought somebody else in for his job and this marketing director job, and that was the sort of because I was very annoyed being messed about. I mean, I got a job at top rank, got fired because I hadn't even started or just about to start, and then ended up at Leicester City, and. They said that because they wanted to move David Pleat on and they wanted to start a clean sheet of paper, so therefore they're going to bring two people in, a new manager and a new director of marketing. Um, so I never really met David Pleat. All I know is I got his office um, and that was... <laughs> And that was, can I swear on this programme or not? Yeah, 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 go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, his office was was basically, it was a room the size of a shit house, and it got no windows <laughs> in it, you know, and the light bulb <laughs> down off the top of the ceiling. 
and uh, a table with one with one leg short and the other three and they had a brick under it to hold it up and a dead plant in the corner and that was the office and the telephone and that was that's all i got well that's that's but to be fair that i mean that shows how far the clubs come i suppose isn't it? i mean because i think you mentioned mm. in the book like that when you joined it was it was quite a um it was still quite maybe for one of the best term it was quite backwards like the, the same sort of families oh. had been involved for years and years and years like you've mentioned the shipments they've been involved since the 50s was am i right yeah, long time, yeah. Long time. Yeah. yeah yeah but i mean that's that's kind of brings me perfectly onto my next question like you were given some quite testing targets when you first started weren't you i mean the, the two that the three sorry that i've kind of got noted down you were asked to generate five and a half million for a new stand you were told to improve community links raise money for the playing squad like what sort of changes did you make early on? Like when you first sat down, you thought, right, I've got to get to work. What what sort of things did you start to do? Like what was your well, first they change? Didn't even, they didn't even have a job description, so I wrote my own because they asked me to write my own <laughs> job description. Because I mean, <laughs> you know, how often you go for a job called director of marketing and they don't know what the content is and they've got no idea what you're, you're going to be doing. So I wrote my own for a start in this dingy shithole. And um, I actually, you know, wrote, and I thought to myself, this place is so far backward, it's not true. It's probably like going back in the 1800s. Um, but what I knew was that there was a, all I could do was make improvements and make change. And that's what the club needed. It was very stuck in its ways. You had people there saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, we've done that, we've tried this. And they didn't want the change. And I felt that I inherited three people, a commercial manager, a lottery manager, and a catering manager. And everything I suggested to them, they didn't want to do, or they'd done it and it didn't work. And I could see I was getting nowhere with these people. And I thought, so if I'm going to succeed in this job, I've got to have people around me that's going to work with me and support me and share my vision. And my vision was to make Leicester City um, a club that people wanted to come to, enjoy the experience of football, but also use it the rest of the week doing different things in the facilities. That was what my vision was. We had very poor communication with the fans. We had no communication with the local authorities. We didn't get involved with local charities. The ethnic groups didn't get involved with us. Um, we had very little people appreciating the sort of culture of the club because it hadn't got a culture. And all I knew is I come from a, a service industry where people matter, customers matter, and fans were customers to me. Um, and I then set about thinking about how we could improve everything. And as one of the things I wanted to do was do our own branding. And you, you've got it on your shirt. Um, we right. had we had um, Bukta as the first um, club, oh, sorry, first company to supply us with shirts. Well, they were ripping us off because they were basically selling seconds to um, other traders in the town. People would buy them then come to the football club and get a full refund. Um, and that's what was going on for quite some time. So mm -hmm. people bought a 10 quid shirt or a five quid shirt, came back and got a 30 quid back uh, on the basis that they bought it from the club shop without no receipt and argued about they wanted a, a refund and got it until we found out exactly what was going on. So I got rid of book to fired them. And I said to Brian Little when he, he joined just after I did, I said, Brian, we're going to do our own branding. Are you in with me? And Brian and I together worked on the Fox Leisure and we decided to cut we, had, we weren't big enough for Adidas and all these other big brands. So we had our own brand, Fox Leisure, and we made more money out of Fox Leisure, that brand, in the retailing, in the catering, in all the things that we did um, than anybody else ever done. And we, we made a lot of money out of Fox Leisure. And that branding still stands today. Yeah. Yeah. I love the Fox Leisure stuff. I was going to ask a little bit more about that later on. So, uh, yeah, Fox Leisure stuff's iconic. I mean, some of the best shirts we've ever had were Fox Leisure ones. So, yeah, I love it. All grateful for that. Ewan? How much of your early work was influenced by the Taylor Report and the financial implications that came with it? Well, the Taylor Report was was um, basically how the club had to start thinking about changing the, the old Filbert Street, because old Filbert Street was held together by chewing gum, straw and bits of string, and were very <laughs> unsafe. Um, and basically... The vision was to have a new stand, which is the one that we had down the side um, on the members' side, um, called what was the East Stand. Sorry, it was the West Stand, but we had then got it sponsored to the Carling Stand. Um, and that was the start of changing Filbert Street and making it more of a family club, much more safer, better facilities, and generating revenue because football clubs rely on off the field revenues to pay for other things that the ticket sales and the, the um, um, TV don't, don't do. 
And um, you know that that Carling stand when we built it, we managed to raise about six seven million pounds. It was the godsend to that club, and it kept us going. But the Taylor report is why they wanted a marketing director to come in. I mean, you imagine going in a job where everything was negative and the, mm. the club had got a very bad reputation. It wasn't even a user friendly club. Everybody was chucked into the stadium like cattle, spoken to like cattle. And, you know, I had to change the whole culture of service, quality, standards, value for money. And that's where I came from. Yeah, I mean, that's that's where having your business background really helped, I suppose, didn't it? So, like you've mentioned there, like you had all these sort of issues, like the Taylor report was one thing you had to try and ad adhere to. You had these these really tif difficult targets that you were set to start off with. Like, what were there? What kind of early challenges were there for you, like to try and overcome, like the finances? You've already mentioned that the club was quite backwards in that. Were there any kind of colleagues that? maybe got in your way like what what were some of the early challenges that you had to overcome when you first got to the club well first of all quite a lot of the colleagues got in the way because they didn't want change and that means they got it i mean i had to get rid of all the catering the commercial manager and the lottery manager because none of them went, wanted to work and none of them wanted to change into the and share the vision that i would presented to them so clearly they were not going to get the club going in the direction i wanted it to go so eventually bit by bit i had to move them on i had to bring the right people in um, I had to get the club to think about fans as being customers rather than fans as being a pain in the arse because that's what <laughs> they used to think. And, you know, the fans moaning and groaning and that. And I had to get on the side of the fans. And one of the things I did, because in the club shop, we the merchandise was quite poor. It was all tacky stuff. And I changed all that, the quality. And one of the things I set up was a, a Fox Leisure Retail forum where mm. a selection of fans from the age of 5 to 95 20, 30 people would come every month, sit in front of um, a few of the staff there, and we'd bring all the stuff that um, people wanted us to sell. So rather than just saying, yeah, we'll, we'll have bottles with Leicester City on and cups and this and that and the other, I made this forum responsible for saying, yes, we'll buy it, no, we won't buy it. And mm -hmm. if the 75% of people said you'll buy something, we sold it. If they said no, we didn't sell it. And then if anybody said to me, why are you selling that strange looking thing in the club shop like that with Leicester City on it? It's because the fans forum said they would buy it. And that was what I did. I gave them the responsibility to tell us what they wanted in their club shop, not the, the commercial managers thinking, oh, I'll stick a pair of dirty knickers in there with a filthy slogan on it, uh, which they did, you know, stop me and try one and all that sort of thing. A bit like seaside stuff mm -hmm. and other things that nobody bought. So we had a lot of stock that nobody wanted to buy because it was rubbish. So we only put things in the shop that people was going to buy and the fans forum decided that. And that was a great way of engaging with the fans. And they were our people are going to buy from us and they told us what they want to buy and therefore we stopped it. And that was a good, good sort of situation from ourselves. Definitely. I think it covers all things. bases really as well, doesn't it? It gives it gives you almost that that well, look, we're listening to you and we're trying to improve obviously the finances at the club by also offering you something you're gonna want rather than something they don't. So it makes sense. It, it's it and, and, and the other thing that it was a very successful which we had we had to overcome, but it wasn't difficult to overcome because I said to Brian Little, I stood out one October night and it was pissing down with rain. And I said to him, There's, there's twenty two guys kicking a ball up and down a, a you know, soggy bloody football pitch and there's no atmosphere there's about 12 people huddled in the corner with a bovril between them and there was it was a dark dingy bloody night and I said why don't we do something and Richard Hughes was one of my um, executives who worked with me and he came up with the suggestion of family night football and we turned all the reserve team games with Brian's permission and with the players involvement and we turned 12 or 14 um, uh, reserve team games into family nights where Mums and dads could come and they pay a couple of quid and the kid pay a quid and for four quid or six quid you could have two a mum and dad and the two two kids come watch a game of football it might be the reserve team but the reserve team would consist of the players getting um uh, you know coming out of injury new players coming in and we did that and that was huge hugely successful and it was a trading day we sold merchandise we sold stuff in the catering kiosks um and that was the way that we got families in at an early age because when i first came to leicester all i saw was chelsea newcastle liverpool manchester united shirts all being worn by kids they weren't wearing leicester city and we then got kids in at an early age 
Saturday Night Football, we had Philbert Fox, which we, we created that character. Um, and we created this family atmosphere where kids can come very young with mum and dad and there'd be no trouble, no aggravation, no swearing, no nothing. And they'd have a great night. Dad were watching the girls do the rah rahing and the and the was watching the football game. The mum bought the knitting and she was sitting there knitting and the kids were watching Philbert Fox and all the other stuff. And it was a great entertaining evening. And we did that. And you can remember, and you probably can't remember because I don't know if you're old enough, but we had a Manchester United reserve team game and we ended up with about 20,000 people turning up and we couldn't cope with it. We had to delay the kickoff. And that was 6,000 more than the actual first team game we had on the following Saturday. Wow. That was a successful formula of bringing kids and families to football and getting kids started. And all of a sudden, the kids' shirts started to sell. Kids bought lots of things and become Leicester fans. We had membership clubs, we had Philbert Fox clubs, we had all sorts of things. And this is how you galvanise and bring people into a community football club. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm going to, I'm just, sorry, you, and I know you've got a question coming no, up, no, no, but sorry. I've got a question about Family Night Football because I wanted to, I, I might as well ask it now. Um, obviously, I'm very grateful for Family Night Football. That's that's exactly how I got into watching the club. I used to go with my dad um, to the Family Night Football games. Um, so, you know, thank, thank you for that. Um, but, uh, it's kind of, it's, there's almost a legacy behind that now. Like obviously, family night football, reserve football is not really a thing. But like particularly when we were sort of teenagers, I don't know if it was quite the same at Newcastle because obviously they were in the Premier League when Leicester in the Championship and League One. But like a lot of clubs ended up doing like kids for a quid and stuff like that to try and encourage families to go and watch football. Do you think that maybe those sort of ideas like family night football maybe inspired more clubs in the lower leagues to kind of influence more young kids and families to come and watch games or well i'll tell you now when we started family night football it was so successful even when the first game we played was about three or four thousand people but we had manchester city manchester united we had uh, lots of clubs birmingham karen karen brady when she ran birmingham came to see what family night football was all about how it was put together what was the model how it could it was you know how it was the process of how it all worked and how successful it was. And a lot of clubs took that away. And we even gave some training days to clubs wanting to set up family night football um, off the back of Leicester City so that they could go and do it in their own football clubs. Here you've got reserve team games with nobody coming up, a handful of people, nothing exciting happening. All of a sudden we turn it into a family occasion. So a lot of people learn from us. We were innovators in our time. We were before our time. The team of people around me we're always one step ahead of everybody else, including the big boys, because I went to Manchester United the first time I came to Leicester City to talk to them. They kept me waiting three hours, and then eventually I just came home. And um, I rang up and said, you know, they said, oh, well, we're busy. Who, who are you? I said, Leicester City. Where, where's that? You know, and that's the sort of attitude you got in those days. And I thought, sod you, we'll show you what we can do. And we did it. And they came to us eventually, and Manchester City, and say Birmingham and a few other clubs, wanted to know how family life football worked. And we kept ahead of all the other football clubs in our innovation. Mm -hmm. Everything that we did in our branding, our marketing, our, our fan relationships, uh, and everything we did, we provided lots of services that other clubs weren't doing. Mm. Yeah, you and you've, you've, you're going to disappear for a second, aren't you? Because you've got yeah. problems with your iPad, but you'll be back in a second. Uh, but you've yeah. got a question first. More you? chicken yeah, wings. So, <laughs> no, it's, it's not this time. Not this time. Got more no, in the oven. Yeah. <laughs> no no that'll be for afterwards lads yeah. Um, but yeah so you're obviously on about families there and fans getting involved and making it accessible for them but obviously you, you faced a little bit of resistance and there was a few critics when it came to requesting money for business and commercial ventures why, why do you think that was do you think it was just cynicism do you think it was just that they weren't i don't know if trustworthy is the right word but they were almost reluctant because they didn't know what was going to come of it what why do you think that was well, I think when I started in the early days, I mean, Brian Little spent 50 grand on a player and I spent 50 grand on marketing. I asked for 50 grand to, to do a, some marketing because the club desperately needed to market itself. It needed to be in the community, it needed to be in the marketplace. It needed to show people what its offer was. And you can only do that through marketing, communication, PR, promotions and whatever. And I can remember going to a board meeting and, and Brian and I got on very well we, we, we got on really and Brian said you know I can buy a play for that 50 grand you're going to give Barry I said well I need 50 grand to get the club you know on its feet so that we can start making some money because bear in mind the playing side spend the money and I'm making the money so you know we needed something to 
to make it happen. You can't just do marketing on fresh air. I mean, in those days, social media weren't invented. So, um, you know, we, we didn't have that uh, luxury. All our marketing was done through direct mail or advertising or pick public relations, press releases or, or whatever. Hmm. So, yeah, there was a bit of resistance at the beginning, but it wasn't nasty resistance. I think it was people just thinking, God, what's he going to do with 50 grand? Yeah. Well, but, that 50 grand lasted me about five years. I spent yeah. about 10,000 pounds a year. And yeah. it brought in eight million pounds worth of revenue from about quarter of a million when I first started there. Yeah, which is which is incredible. And that's that's kind of where that's kind of what I wanted to I mean, go into later. Like there, there's so much success that it's it, it is like we'll get onto that later on. But you, you mentioned Brian Little there and you said you had a great relationship with him. Like, how important was he in sort of along with what was going on on the commercial side, getting him in? How was he important? How important was he, sorry, in the upturn in Leicester's fortunes? And what was he like to work with? You know, he's, he's I think because of O'Neill came in after for the fans, Brian Little almost kind of gets maybe not not forgotten about, but overlooked a little bit. Like how, how important do you think Brian Little was? And, you know, what was he well, like you've to work got with? To, you've got to remember that I think Brian Little was the cornerstone of turning the club around from where it was when it was it was being managed by the other, the other uh, manager we spoke about. And Brian, Brian did miracles on 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 ten quid. Mm. Brian did a lot of things that other managers couldn't do. He brought players, um, bargain basement players, and made them perform. He took us to Wembley a couple of times. I think it was two or three times. I can't remember. Mm. Um, and Brian worked very close with me because together you have to work with a manager to get to both of you understand what each other's needs and requirements are. I had to grow the business. Brian had to grow his football team. Brian was a very successful manager. I was very privileged to work with Brian. Um, it's a shame he went to, to Villa, but there you are. It's people's careers, they're looking to change their careers and develop their careers. But he was instrumental, I think, in all the things that we did because he went along with it. He agreed with it. He was keen to be part of it. And Brian and Mark McGee, even though he was only there for a year, Mark McGee and Brian were two two great guys to work with, but I think Brian did miracles with the money he had. Yeah, I think I think he. My dad's always spoke quite highly of Brian Little. Like I think because like Brian, uh, Brian Little was there bef very much before my time. Like the earliest memories I kind of had were like O'Neill and then Peter Taylor. So the very sort of tail end of when you were at Leicester, I feel like my a lot of my impressions of Brian Little and how successful he was and how important he was sort of come from stories really seeing it and seeing it firsthand so you know to hear how how loved he was both in and out the club is from inside and outside is is incredible so i don't think anybody could have done what brian little did on what on what little money he had i think brian was an amazing character amazing manager and he worked so hard for the club was so passionate and he you know collectively we worked well together and i think that was the probably the one of the success stories that two people could work together in different parts of the business mm. and uh, make it make it successful. And um, you know, if somebody gets a chance to go and work for another, another football club with a lot more money and more opportunities and more scope, well, it's their careers and that's what they do. You have to accept that, you know. Yeah. And uh, I was sorry to see Brian go. I mean, do you think? Do you think? And I don't mean this disrespectfully to Brian at all. Like, do you think that maybe he was? really grateful for the opportunity because you took him from league two correct was he at darlington in league like well the old division division three yeah. like well he got a chance to to come to leicester and it was in darlington you're quite right but then again he came to what a club with no manager um a team that nearly dropped down into the next league down but i think was saved by a skin of a teeth or either a point or a hair or whatever it was that saved us i can remember tony what his name was the player just managing to keep us there but he came and took the challenge on now how many people would want to do that and made a success of it he, he really went out of his way to show what a good manager he was how he could turn a football team from nothing into something yeah yeah and i think i think like i say i think he maybe gets overshadowed a little bit by what came next so i think i think i think he's brilliant like the more i read about him the more you learn about him from people like I think he's he's massively understated, uh, Brian Little, by a lot of people, particularly of my generation. Anyway, he is, so. he is, and 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 the trouble is, people only remember things at the towards the end of the of the nineties rather than the beginning and the middle. You know, mm, absolutely. So, um, oh, oh, he's gone. 
He's gone. He's gone for his, he's gone for his chicken wings again. Hasn't he? <laughs> well, I don't know. He's having problems. He, he, he third week in a row. He's been having all sorts of technical problems. I don't know what's going on. He so wants to buy like, these. He wants to buy <laughs> these laptop then. Didn't he? Like, <laughs> I'll ask. I'll ask his question instead. So um, obviously, I, I know this. Like I, I've experienced it firsthand all the time. But Leicester have, in in my lifetime and in recent years in particular, Leicester have always seemed like they are massively influential in the community, but that wasn't always the case, was it? When you first came into the job, he, the club weren't really close with the community. They didn't do a lot of work with the community. So what sort of work did you and the club do to to maybe build those bridges? What sort of things did you do to try and improve that? Well, because I, I can tell you now, when I first got there, nobody had a good word to say about Leicester City because I can remember meeting a business person because, I mean, my job was to go and get investment and to get £6 million and do the commercial revenue to develop it and, and lots of other things. And I can remember someone saying, why have you come to this football club? It's crap, you know, mm. you're wasting your time. Um, and nobody had a good word for Leicester because I think Leicester themselves have let themselves down over the years because they really hadn't appreciated what a fan does and, yeah. you know, the value of a fan. And the value of a fan is he puts his hand in his pocket, he buys tickets every week, whether they play good or bad or indifferent, and he supports the club. Mm. And I knew that. And I knew what we had to do to bring fans on board. And there was a big gap between the fans and the club. There was no relationship with the local authorities. As I said to you earlier, no relationship with the local community or the local charities or the ethnic groups or, or disabled groups. We did nothing for nobody. And consequently, that's why they had very small gates of seven or 8,000 in the early days. And mm. I knew I got to build some big bridges. And I spent a lot of time meeting people, sharing my vision, talking about what we're going to be doing. And you were saying, well, what did I have to do? I had to give people the confidence I knew what I was doing and what I was going to do and how I was going to deliver that message, offer, and so on. And that was a big job. I mean, I spent 12, 14 hour days there, you know, because there was that much to do bringing the club back into the you know, 21st century. Yeah, and I think that's that's the thing, isn't it? Like, I think when you think about how, or the position that the club was in when you, like, when you kind of took over, or when you took over the job, like, it it kind of goes back to the point. Like, you, you're trying to modernise a football club that, as you've kind of detailed in the book, and as you've sort of said so far tonight, like, it was very backwards, wasn't it? It was very set in its ways, and lots of people resistant to change. And that kind of brings me on to the next point, which is like the Carling Stand. Like, it's that was such a monumental effort you had to go through to raise the money for that didn't you like i mean i've got i'll, I'll try and find it here in the book because honestly it's I, I was reading it and i was just engrossed by the effort and the length that you went to so in the end you ended you ended up trying to get you could probably tell me off the top of your head i don't know why i'm reading the book but like so much effort to try and get that money you ended up getting it over the line with a loan didn't you like what was what was that loan like secured against? Was it off like revenue from the Premier League? Like how how did you manage to talk talk us through that? How did you manage to get the Carling Stand built in the end? Well, the Carling Stand obviously was the vision that the club had because that's talking about the Tay report earlier on, and also they needed something to make money because the existing member stand or the West Stand was just basically falling to bits. Um, but the thing was, which I found was incredible, that when I first looked at the drawings, all the because the stand was obviously quite a long stand. All the rooms had block walls in them, so you couldn't really open them up to make a big, long facility. There was going to be small, four or five small rooms. And I said, hang on a minute. First of all, we need to be able to open these rooms up so that you could have 6,000 or five, or sorry, 1,000 people or six lots of 100 people in each room and buy dividers. So the club had got no idea what they were building, and even the architects weren't really much, much better. And I said, no, you know, we need to get this stand, maximise it. it. It's going to have 9,000 seats in it and it's going to maximise it and it's going to pay for itself. And again, I was talking to business people. I was going out meeting lots of people. And, and the first 12 or 18 months, I, I, I entertained people. I wind and dined them to the point where I put three stone on. And, <laughs> you know, because people in those days, in the 90s, liked their lunches. They liked to go out for a, a business lunch and have a mm. chat. And, and then you could get some money out of them or get them to sponsor a, um, a game or they, they buy a box or what, executive box, whatever. And 
you know, it was it was a confidence. I had to get people to have confidence in me. And, you know, I knew what I was going to do and I was going to get there. And people did have the confidence in me, which is good, because they've got no confidence in anybody else there, um, <clears throat> except Brian. <clears throat> so um, I remember talking to one guy um, who was um, a cardboard um, manufacturing guy and um, cardboard boxes. And he said to me, Barry, I've heard what you've got to say and I want an, a new box in this new stand. And he gave me a cheque for 75 grand. Now, that's a lot of money in the 90s. He gave me yeah. a cheque for 75 grand, which would have been a box for, for five years, £15,000 a year for five years. He paid up front. And we managed to get people to pay things up front or over two or three years as opposed to five years. Um, I got a loan from Bass um, or a grant from Bass, call it the Carling Stand. I got a quarter million pound from the um, City Challenge, which is a, in, in, in a city development program to help the inner city. Um, I got sponsors who did debentures. We did all sorts of different schemes to raise this money. And I think we're about just over a million pounds short. And because we're a million pounds short, I then managed to then get the the ground um, released from its covenant, which means that the ground was owned by the city council, not by the football club. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we did a deal with them so that they could have X value pounds worth of uh, tickets and other things for the less privileged people in Leicester. And we could have a, 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 some asset back and that asset helped us to secure that million pounds. Yeah, I mean, it was. I was reading through that chapter, and genuinely, like, it was it was staggering, like the lengths you went to and the different ways you managed to obtain the money. Like, it's, and you, I mean, it must have been a great source of pride for you because you managed to achieve one of the the, the key targets that were set out to you the day you you signed on the dotted line. So, I even got I even got Prince Charles to come um, in his helicopter, and and because we were doing an environmental green thing with the city council, mm. the environmental city was called then in those days, and we did a lot of green issues, recycling issues and things. And I even got Prince Charles to come. I went to the board meeting and told all the staff and, and the directors, and they all laughed at me. Thought I was an, an utter. I said, "No, he's coming." <laughs> and actually, when he came, they all couldn't get enough of him because all the players were there, and the chairman was there, director there, everybody was jumping on him like you know, hot potato. So. <laughs> You know, I did make things happen, and if I said I was going to do something, I did it. Yeah, and you can't you can't follow that. To be fair, I mean, you, uh, we'll get on to some of the like commercial and football like, on the pitch and off the pitch awards you got. I mean, the proofs in the in the pudding there, but yeah. So I mean, yeah, the the I, I can only commend you for that because it's it's one hell of an achievement managing to get that stand built. So part of a job. It's my job to do that. That's what I was there for. But I was a driver. I was enthusiastic. I was very young and dynamic. And I was going to deliver what I set out. My vision was to make that football club a premiership club. But we yeah. got there eventually. Yeah, and well, that, that leads us perfectly on to the next question, I suppose. Sorry about my technical difficulties, by the way. Um, I it's guess every week now. It's, it's every week now, you, and it's not it's not good enough. It's every week oh, now. <laughs> oh, I think you should get a new, so you should get a new laptop, you, and stop eating those chicken wings. <clears throat> <laughs> I need to save up doing that. Um, hey, to be fair, on the phone, the, crack, the crackling's gone. The crackling's gone. Now you're on the phone. Well, the chicken well, crackling at yeah. least there. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, like I said, this is probably a bit of an obvious question. It probably feels like, um, like, well, um, it's a bit obvious that sustaining your place in the Premier League is obviously important. But how significant was it? Because you actually ended up winning trophies along the way as well. What did that do for Leicester as a base? Where did that kind of allow you to go? Obviously, um, player-wise, in terms of how the fans felt about everything, um, how important was that uh, Premier League sustainability? Well, getting in the Premier League, you know, because the Premier League was quite new. In, it started in was it 92 or 93, I can't remember which year it was. It was quite new. Yeah. And so getting into the Premier League was um, an accolade, wasn't it? It was almost like an award but because you, we got in there eventually. And, you know, to get in there, it was a case of staying in there. I know, I can't remember which year it was. One of the years we came down again for something. I can't remember which year it was. And I have to remind me because I'm a bit... It's a long time ago, uh, but um, went went up, went up in '94, came down, went back up again in '96. That's right. Yes, I couldn't, I, I couldn't remember the dates, but um, yeah, it, it is important. Um, you know, we had a, a fantastic season when we were in the Premier League. I mean, the money was good. The, the fans all of a sudden came out of nowhere. I mean, we, what annoys me about football is when you're in the Premier League, you know, the regulars 
are there, but then all of a sudden there's these extra funds that pop up from nowhere. Then when you go back into, into the next division down, down, they just half of them disappear again, which I think is a bit naughty, really. If it's a football club you support, you support them through thick and thin. And that's my view. But anyway, it's very important. You need to be sustainable. But new clubs coming into the Premier League, unless there wasn't a sexy club in those days, it took a long time to get to become sexy. Um, sometimes you struggled. A lot of clubs go into the Premier League, come out again and try and get back in again. Unless it wasn't one of those top six or middle six, it was a bottom six at the mm. time. And, you know, we fought hard. We stayed in there as much as we could. But sometimes the finances for other clubs were bigger and better than ours. And that's why eventually we floated in 96 or 97. Yeah, I and mean, it's, 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 like, it's such a good period for the club like like i said earlier like prior to maybe the last nine years and the, the unfathomable heights that we've been to in the last few years like i remember growing up like when i really started to start, take football seriously we were champions we were back in the second division regularly like we dropped into the third division like in my love for the club vested from the fact that you know i'm a local lad it's it's where i'm from I'm, i take a lot of pride in that like whereas young people in the 90s young people now they saw a lot of success but like you must have some really good memories yourself. Like I imagine some of the people you probably got to meet from the other clubs, like when you were before and after games, like you, you must have some really, really good memories and stories from that period. Is there any, any, anything that stands out for you? Any good memories or stories? Well, I was, I was very met? privileged to meet um, Beckham and his girlfriend. Um, what's the surname? What's the first name? Um, Victoria. Pop, Victoria, Victoria Adams, yeah. it was then Victoria yeah. Adams. They, they used my office, closed the blinds, and locked the door for about an hour. So I <laughs> that, that, that would have been a, a, quite an interesting. Um, if if I had a camera or a you know a, a video inside the thing, it would be an interesting session. But you know, they they came. I met them. I met um, uh, Kevin Keegan. I, I met lots of people. I met um, managers, players, um, yeah, and royalty. Um, comedians, um, show business people. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's that many people, I can't remember them all, there's loads of them. I even, met, I even met a king from Africa who came over to see us. So, you know, it was a very interesting journey and experience. And mm. yeah, um, did more than just a job. Yeah, I mean, we've got quite a few here. We've got, got Ewan, of course, and we've got quite a few of the like, core fan base that we have is a lot of Newcastle fans. Uh, what was Kevin Keegan like? What was, what was he like as a person? I got on well with Kevin. He was very amenable, very, uh, very um, easy to um, work with. I remember, and, and, and a nice guy, and, and couldn't do enough for us. I remember having George Best and, um, uh, not, is it Rodney Marsh? I think it was Rodney Marsh. Who's got the blonde hair? Was it, was it Rodney Marsh? Blonde hair? Yeah, or yeah, probably. Yeah, probably, I think yeah, so. yeah. I can remember having George Best and Rodney Marsh come into a, a sporting dinner, um, and they were both drunk stroke anything else that they could squeeze up the nose and down the throat so <laughs> and they were a sporting dinner and the, all they did was come out and they were so pissed they just sat in front of the audience 500 people and they just sat there laughing and giggling and falling off the chair and that was very embarrassing when people had spent you know i don't know 600 700 quid to come and be entertained by two former football players talking about their careers well they, they didn't talk about anything they just like so eventually we kicked him out and then i had to get mark mcgee to talk about his life story um not quite as exciting and, and thrilling but he, he saved the day and you know then they had the cheap the agent to ring up and ask for some, for some money i told him to f off you know um <laughs> because because um they shouldn't have been in that state in the first place i True. also remember we had a sporting dinner when um, Ian Botham came with, um, who's the other guy you used to go with? Um, Ian Botham, another chap, um, another cricket player. Anyway, sporting dinners, speakers normally come after the meal and talk after you've had your meal. But they turned up and said, we want to talk now. And they said, well, we can't talk now because we've got a meal coming at it. No, no, we've got another engagement on later on tonight. I said, you never told me that, otherwise I want to book you. And they wanted to talk before the meal and we had to mess about holding all the food back while these two idiots, both the, both of them fall, I can't remember the chap's name. Anyway, they spoke and then they buggered off to Birmingham to do another show. Uh, and I thought that was very naughty. Um, and you get things like that, which I find, you know, hmm. unacceptable. Yeah, I, I can understand. I mean, it's frustrating, isn't it? But some good stories there. I mean, I'm not being, I've 
I've not been thinking I've, I've, I've don't think I've heard a more entertaining thing all day than Posh and Beck using your office as a uh, as well, a shag pad for the evening. You know, I can take. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I mean, you know. Well, I mean, we well, one can only imply, can't we? I don't. We probably <laughs> we infer from context, but. <laughs> well, they were, they were in love, and I think that was the thing about it because they weren't married then. I think they were in love, and she was, hadn't seen him for a long time. I think, and then he went, they said, "Can we go somewhere private?" So we'll give him a big cuddle. Just, just, just give him a big cuddle. Just give her, give her, yeah, give her a nice cuddle for an hour. I didn't even get a signature or autograph. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> you probably would have been if you'd yeah, have probably got a signature if you used a black light in your office afterwards. That probably would have. Uh, There'd have been some signatures in there, then I reckon. Oh, honestly, Ooh. That's, Ooh. that's 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 mad. That's, that's incredible. That, is. that that wasn't in your book, Barry. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, talk, right. We're, we're talking. We're talking talk about some legend. positive stuff. Yeah, yeah talking about um, obviously legends and people within the game. Obviously, Jack's. This is like a really big thing for Jack. But you worked with people like Buzzy, is it Emil Heskey, Steve Walsh, Neil Lennon, um, obviously Martin O'Neill. Um, what was it like for one? But who did you really like working with? Who was who did you have really good experiences with? Who did you really really enjoy, like the company of? Who were you impressed by? Who set the standards? Who who did you, I who, think? Who really like leaves a good positive mark in your memory? I think Steve Walsh was certainly one of the people that I got on very well with because Steve was um, very easy to get on with. The problem with the football players was Martin O'Neill didn't like the players to mix or talk to people like myself or the commercial team so a lot of the players were frightened to come and speak to me and if they spoke to me and chatted to me it was a way when Martin O'Neill wasn't there why he did that I don't know uh, I never know that to today but Steve Walsh was different he got on with me because he was there before Martin O'Neill was there anyway and and a few others um, I got on with most of the um, players um, but it was a strange thing when Martin came where he didn't want the football players mingling with the people like myself or talking to the commercial team. Um, and um, it, it just created this sort of little bit of a rift, I felt, or them and us. And it's not what I think a football club is about. But yeah. all of them were, were great guys to work with. Yeah, what, what, um, why, why do you think there was? Because I mean, this, this is where, I mean, Unfortunately, now, like if you've seen the line of questioning we're going through, like we are kind of getting towards the the tail end, which is where everything kind of sort of went sour. Well, why do you think things with O'Neill were fractious? Where, where do you think that came from? Because surely, based on I mean everything you've said and the facts themselves, the club was going in the right direction in your in in your remit on the pitch. Things were going well as well. Like, why do you think things weren't? Well, Good between you, like why did you've that? Got to, you've got you've got to bear in mind that I had a couple of enemies in a few enemies in that football club. There's a couple of directors who didn't like me, um, and they went out of the way to be difficult. Um, there was also a couple of senior management people there who didn't like me, mm. um, for whatever reason I don't know. And you know, I'm not there to be liked. I'm there to get things done. And I yeah. do know that Martin O'Neill would have been um, briefed by several people before he arrived at the club about me and don't get involved with me and you know I don't know who he thinks he is and all that sort of thing and you know don't, don't trust him and I can imagine all that going on and I can imagine Martin having a very bad um, feel about me before he even started and I consequently the first day I met Martin and nearly walked through the door I just said to him hello my name is Barry Pierpont I'm the chief executive pleased to meet you and I'm here to work with you and help you and his attitude was i don't need anything from you don't have it don't I, I don't want anything to do with you and i don't want any help from you and i thought that was very strange to say to somebody in a football club who was there to raise money and generate revenue for buying players and to support him and i found that very poor and yeah. and he, his attitude was he's obviously been got at by certain people and um you know, he, he never really liked me from that day, to be honest. I, I always try to help him and support him, but he was very distant with me. Hmm. I think sometimes with, with some people, like, pride often gets in the way. And I'm not saying that, like, like it was... You, you understand what I mean? Like, sometimes people's pride, like, they, they have a set way of doing things. You have a set way of doing things. And unfortunately, you just put heads and that, that kind of doesn't work out. And... 
before we get onto it too much, because obviously that's that's kind of the the end of the, of that chapter for you at Leicester. Like when when things were going so well on the pitch, it was always you have to kind of see that it, it was always going to be a losing battle, wasn't it? Like the person in the boardroom versus the person on the pitch. Like it's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult for you to win people back over. Um, well, yeah, the problem is though um, that. Because Martin was, I mean, Martin had some bad times when he first started there. And I actually went into the car park at the club and talked to a load of fans and told him to leave him alone and let Martin settle into the job because he didn't really do very well at the start. He was struggling a bit and uh, people were calling for his head. Um, obviously, he turned that round later on. But, you know, I, I, I felt I was, you know, prejudged by Martin unfairly. Mm. for for no reason whatsoever because i'd done nothing wrong to him I'd, I'd caused no issues to him and i felt that he was being totally unfair towards me when i think slightly not happy that i was very successful i won lots of awards at the football club for different things and i can remember him saying to somebody once they told me that he was in charge of the football club because he was the manager and you know and because other people like myself was doing very well and were successful i don't think he particularly liked that yeah, I think. Yeah, it's, it. I mean, we'll we'll dive into it a little bit more, but I want I want to I want to talk one like just I say one more positive before we get into the way things ended. I really want to talk to you about just if we run off all the things that you, you and the club achieved when you were there. So, first award that you kind of got, whether this be on the pitch or off the pitch, you got the first, the very first environmentally friendly football club in the UK, nineteen ninety one. Player final runners up in ninety two. Investors in people award ninety three. Playoff final runners up in '93, Family Football Award for Progress in '94, Playoff final winners in '94, Program of the Year winners in both '95 and '96, Playoff final winners in '96, League Cup winners '97, Boss of the Year '98, Ease Awards in '99, Leicestershire Business Sales and Marketing Award '98, League Cup runners up '99, and the turnaround. This is a personal one for you, the Turnaround Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 1999. What I see there. I mean, I kind of, I'm not a neutral, I'm a Leicester fan, so I'm invested in this. Ewan's kind of a neutral. But what you see there is that there's clearly some sort of link between success off the pitch and success on the pitch, isn't there? So, I mean, how much pride do you take in that? I mean, like, yes, despite how everything ended, that club, with your, your time when you were there, the club improved massively. You must take some serious pride in that. Well, it did because I went there on a two million pound turnover and a one million pound loss, or the way around. I think it's one million pound turnover and two million pound loss. We used to sell players when I first went there to just to balance the books. I mean, over the years, I I paid for the Carling stand within three years, and it should have been paid for in seven. Mm. Um, I turned the commercial turnover from nothing to about eight million in eight years. The club went from about one or two million to twenty five million in eight years, nine years. Um, what more could we do? And bear in mind, we didn't have um, a family or a, a, a rich uncle or a huge investor in the football club. Mm. The only investment we ever had was the £12 million pounds that we raised on the stock market in 97 when we floated the football club. And then some of the fans and people put money into the to float the football club as a PLC, uh, where fans could buy some shares in the club. That's That's the only money we ever had. We didn't have the money that the club's got today and the people behind the club today. We had to fight for every penny we made. And that's the difference between then and now, where football is a big business. But I was very successful, and my team and I were, and Martin was very successful. And I think together, if he'd have not listened to other people who were, who were feeding him with crap in his mind, together we could have been a very successful force working together. Yeah, I think I think yes, yeah, it's, it's a shame, isn't it? Because you do kind of think what what could have been like, yeah. because of that. So yeah, I mean, I mean, it's 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 unfortunate, but we have to end end on a sour note, don't we? Like because that's how how it ended. So yeah, Ewan. Yeah. So um, 18th of September, Liverpool and Leicester playing each other, ended two two. All of a sudden, it's peer point out. How did you get to that? How did it come to it? After all of the positive things you've clearly done, because we've listed them all, we've, we've shown that. You did so much for the community. You did so much for the club. You generated revenue. You did so much positive. Yet, 
it was Pierre Point out. How did you get to it and how did you feel about it? Well, to me, that was orchestrated by two of the directors and some of the staff that didn't, and some of the managers that didn't like me. And you can see in the book, there's two directors uh, behind a stand or in a stand talking to people with the bloody pat with the banners. And they're the people that orchestrated it along with the newspaper um, and along with some of the um, senior managers there. You know, there's a handful of people who didn't like you. You can't be liked by everybody because no. sometimes you, you'd have to do things that other people don't like. Um, one particular director who didn't like me was trying to buy me off. Um, you know, when I got a new contract, he tried to pay me off and say, you give me X, Y pounds. And I said, no, because I'm, I'm worth five times more than that. My contract's worth five times. And he took an instant liking to that. So he never he never let go. And mm -hmm. when you've got people like that working against you and stirring up the shit and throwing shit at you and telling everybody all the crap and then getting Martin O'Neill to join their little group, Mm. Um, because that's the way they're going to get people out. That was all wrong. I mean, mm. in a normal industry business, you wouldn't have that situation happening. Yeah, you wouldn't think, have that allowed. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of interesting. It takes me on to the next question, where it's like, how do you feel that it was handled by the club? Obviously, you said somebody tried to buy you off, but the club in general, because obviously, there's not not everybody in the club didn't like you. There's, you'd obviously had some people yeah. that would have supported you, like. How do you think they handled it? And like, why did it all end up in the public domain? Because it was very widely known. Like I, I spoke to, I went to a um, a meeting with Union FS, who obviously like the, the fan group now, and you, your name got brought up and I was just like, I'm, I'd love to get hear some stuff because obviously I'm talking to you this week. And I was like, like, why, why do people have this negative thing? Because as I was reading your book, I was thinking it's, a lot of success has been brought to the club and clearly you've, upset someone or someone's taken a dislike along along the way how do you feel it was handled by the club how did it how exactly did it all end up in the public domain well it was i mean bear in mind i had three or four directors who supported me and worked with me and I had a couple of directors who hated me and you know when you've got a couple of directors who hate you and then trying to get the manager to to team up with them and uh, and you know the manager's quite by that time was quite a strong character because of all the success on the field um I thought it was handled very badly. It should have been kept in a boardroom and it didn't. It spilled into the public domain. I mean, when you've got dirty washing to talk about and there was a lot of issues that went off in that boardroom that um, isn't in that book and I'm not going to talk about them because, mm. you know, it's some of them can be quite contentious. Mm. Um, you know, those things should be kept in a boardroom. That's what a boardroom is about. But no, some people decide then to roll it into the street and make a meal of it and think, well, the only way to get Pierpoint out is to get people on it against him and I mm. hate to say this the crowd of people that wanted me out didn't really know why they wanted me out mm. I, I, kind of, I kind of draw some similarities at the moment to John Rudkin like I mean this it's been a really long and I, I I'm somebody at the moment who thinks that may I, I never really like to advocate for people losing their job but I just think that when you look at the facts of it at the moment, like in, in your book, in your book, you said that you were refusing to give these players like really big contracts, weren't you? Whereas, and then when you left, a lot of these players did get big contracts, but obviously Rudkin has given all these players really big contracts. And now we're in the shit because of that. So I'm like, I don't think he's up to the task. Maybe we should go Whereas you were kind of tightening the purse strings to stop that from happening. Weren't you? And like, well, you, I, I didn't actually get involved with the con players contracts. That was the chairman who didn't, who didn't mm. John Elson, who didn't particularly like me at the time. So he, he didn't really work with me. I didn't really get involved in that. But but I did, I, you know, at board meeting, I did say things which I wasn't happy about. Mm. And, um, you know, because I spoke my mind and I was a, wrong, a very strong character and I'm a man of conviction and, you know, I, I am professional what I do. People don't always like you to speak the truth yeah. and speak things as they are. They want yes people. Well, I'm not a yes man. I never have been. And, you know, um, that chairman worked with another director and worked with Martin, and they seem to have broken away from the other directors and myself. And it looked like the gang of four, as they called us in, in those days. I thought that was quite funny, um, as if we were going around with, you know, shotguns and bone arrows and things, you know, <laughs> gang of four. We were four people who were trying to keep the, the ship, you know, and the club steering down a very, very tough road uh, and keep it afloat while people were causing crap and shit for me. And, mm. um, 
you know, it, it's it's very silly. And a lot of people don't really understand what went off and what, what happened behind the scenes. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, my career was ruined because of people not understanding what what it was all about. And yeah. very devious and tactical directors, chairman stroke directors, doing things with staff, managers and the manager to, to remove me mm. and other directors as well that got removed. Yeah. And you said you've mentioned as well, like people don't really understand the severity of it, like that kind of, I mean, you, you felt that yourself, didn't you? Like you and you, you had a question about that, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So you were threatened and obviously um, it came to the point where I'm assuming it felt very, very serious and even the police became involved. Um, to what extent did that affect you and your family? To what extent did you feel like that was a serious threat? And and what do you put it down to? Why, why did that happen? That's not something that should happen. It's completely unacceptable. It, I don't know why it seems to be tolerated in football circles almost. It's happened, it still happens now. Um, how, how did that make you feel at the time? And Well, I, I think a lot of it is down to media frenzy. And I think, I hate to say it, a certain selection of fans only follow what they read in the papers or all listen to on the news. And so consequently, if you tell them that you know, there's a pig going to fly past the at 10 past nine tonight. They all believe it. So, you know, they, they, the media didn't help. The, the frenzy was was really sort of galvanised. Um, I had to live in my house with, with security guards living there 24-7. It's quite strange when you go to bed and you've got two guys sitting in your front room watching telly um, <laughs> trying to look after you when when there's a brick going through your window or there's going to be somebody smacking your car up. I got um, people bumping into me in supermarkets, giving me death threats. And the biggest one I found was quite interesting. I was driving up the M1 to Leeds to go and watch Leicester versus Leeds. And the police pulled me over when I was driving the Mercedes. And I thought, oh, dear, I'm not speeding, am I? I was talking <laughs> to somebody in the car. I got Richard Hughes with me. When took, and they pulled me over and they stopped me. I said, yes, officer, can I help you? He said, I said, is everything okay? He said, no, it's not. I said, why? What's the matter? What have I done wrong? He said, no, no, no. We've had a death threat. Uh, are you married beer point? I said, yes, I am. I said, yes, I am. He said, right, well, come with us. And two police cars escorted me, one at the front, one at the back, escorted me all the way to Leeds. And that was just in there, one near Nottingham, that was. Yeah. So I got escorted all the way up to Leeds by two police cars on the basis that my life was going to be in danger. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I, I was saying this, like, when, again, when I was at that Union FS meeting, like a lot of people were saying, like, because obviously a lot of things kicked off over this season. Like, there's been some like fat Leicester fans fighting other Leicester fans, and I sort of said, like, I, I never really get. I, I understand that people are very passionate about their football clubs, and like, because I, I am, but like, I just don't get why it spills that much. Like, football is incredibly important to a lot of people. I've never really understood that, so it's it's such a shame that it got to that point. Really, like in. Like, do you think that, and I mean, I, I don't know this, you didn't, I, 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 I don't know if this is the case or not, but do you feel like you got, af after this sort of thing happened, like it actually came to death threats and like people attacking your home and stuff like that, do, do you feel like you got the support from the club and the board that you, you needed? Do you think that was something they were forthcoming with or do you think that they were kind of hoping that you would leave and it would sort of disappear? Well, You've got to bear in mind, as I said, we had a fractious board. We had um, myself and three other directors um, who worked very close together. And you've got the chairman at the time and another director who were close together and they galvanised the manager and so on and one or two others. And it was, you, you tolerated each other uh, as you do in boardrooms because, you know, everybody doesn't get on. Um, and... I felt that the, the chairman and the other director were troublemakers and had been troublemakers since I'd been there all the time because they wanted their own way all the time and couldn't get it. Um, one of the directors was the chairman previously and got demoted, so it, that, he didn't like that. So I felt there's a lot of um, bad feeling for those two because they, they wanted to do everything their way and the other four of us wouldn't let them. And I think that was the problem. And... Let me just say this to you and all the fans that's out there listening to this. When I left in 2000, I was ousted out through an AG, EGM 
um, and paid off. A um, couple of years later, the chairman then was John Elsom and I think it was Peter Taylor, the manager. How could they manage to, after I left it with a three million pound profit, how can they manage to go bust for 60 million two years down the line? Mm. Well, I wasn't there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. So you, you just mentioned then you left it. What, so you left, what month were you like? January 2000, I left. And yeah. then two years later, in 2002, the club went tits up for, for about 60 million. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember like that. So that was my first sort of full season with a season ticket, 2002 to 03. Like Nicky Summerby playing playing for free, like didn't didn't have a contract basically. Like it's yeah, it's ridiculous how it changed, like how it went from such a high point to where it ended up. But like you say, you left in January 2000, but then May 2000, this person who you've not gone well with very well, O'Neill, he leaves as well. Like like Ewan, like you 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 you, yeah. you were interested in that, weren't you? Like you said that yeah. you were shocked by that as well. Yeah, I think what's interesting for me is um, I'm part Scottish, so my, the other half of my family are actually Celtic. Um, and obviously, Martin O'Neill's probably one of the most heralded managers up there. He's so well thought of as a bloke, as a manager, what he did, how much uh, success he got. Um, how did you feel when he left? Were, were, you, were you kind of a bit gutted? Were you frustrated, angry, upset? How did you feel? Because obviously, I know no. we discovered your relationship with him wasn't necessarily the best. It was a little bit frosty. But, the, um, the relationship was success, because so. of the way he treated me, not because of the way I treated him. The relationship absolutely, was yeah. because yeah, he, yeah. he didn't want to get on with me. I went out my way to, to, to help him every possible way. But if he wanted to be difficult with me, I couldn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. I I was annoyed only slightly because um, my career was ruined because of these other directors and managers or what they did. But I also think Martin wanted to leave the club anyway because he'd been talking about leaving the club on different occasions, going to different clubs mm. um, over the last two or three years he was there. And then I, I believe he, he'd come to the end of his tether with Leicester and in the sense of what he could do for it. And then <clears throat> I knew he would be going at some point. And did I you think, just think that was going to be a part of the way? Or did you think that he was actually looking to move on and, and almost maybe he thought of himself as a bit too big for the club uh, at that point? Due to the I don't, think, he yeah, I don't think it was. I don't think it was too big. I, I actually, <laughs> I actually think that <clears throat> that um, if he looked after the directors in the sense of getting rid of the other four directors and myself, then he could have a nice sail, sail, sail out of the club into the next club he wanted to go to. So yeah, I, I think the, it was an he arrangement. Played the game quite well. Yes, it was an arrangement, I think, where if he helped the couple of directors to get rid of um, us four, the gang of four, we were so called, he then could have an easy exit out of the club. And I think that's how it, I think that's how did, it, in my view, how it um, transpired. <clears throat> did you see him having the success at Celtic that he did have? Obviously, with him having success at Leicester, did you think, yeah, that he'll go and be a success there? Or did you think, oh, that's a big job? Obviously, a lot of pressure, old firm, Rangers being very very successful at the time he came in and obviously turned that round but um do you think that he was going to make a success of that move when he first made it move up to scotland do you want my honest answer to that yeah yeah i yeah. didn't think anything i didn't think anything because he had done nothing for me and i couldn't be right. bothered to think about where he was going to go next because he he left after i'd gone and quite frankly i'd gone on to new new pastures somewhere else mm -hmm. fair enough yeah, that's fair enough, fair enough. Very mature of you, Barry. So it's not very, not used to that level of maturity on this no. podcast. So. <laughs> no toxicity but, tonight. Uh, well, that's that's interesting because we're. I want. I wanted to end a little bit of fun. Um, you've told us some great stories already. Like, I just wanted to hear some gossip. Like, that's such an iconic period for the club. Like, there's got to be some good stories from. Like, whether that's I don't know, best manager player you worked with. Like, any players that gave you like trouble but in, in like a good natured way like you had people like Robbie Savage at the time like surely there's got to be some gossip about players like him like are, good, are, any, are there any really good stories about any of the players coaches anything you know you know if I gave you some juicy gossip I would end up in a law court so <laughs> I you know it's all right saying these things but you know when I wrote my book it had to go through all the mm. legal barriers to make sure that I don't end up being sued or liable yeah. for slander or libelous or whatever um, are there any legal stories you can tell us? <laughs> yeah, is there any that are out there in the domain that you want to expand on or any that you think 
they'd actually maybe appreciate you painting them in a good light. Because us as fans, I think the difficulty with us as fans is sometimes we feel quite distant from them. Even as we speak to you, it's quite surreal because you've worked with some like huge personalities in the game. And yet me and Jack are fans. We've, we've got season ticket holders at our respective clubs. Um, and and we, we love our clubs for what they are, but it's almost like sometimes they walk on the pitch, do the business on the pitch, and then we, we don't really know anything about them more than maybe what is from their PR team on social media. That is literally it. So to hear some stories from those times is a little bit more, I don't know, it almost intrigues me because there wasn't social media. There wasn't that mm. that that window into their lives. So is there anything that maybe paints them in a really positive light as well? Something they might actually thank you for rather than sue you for? All I'm going to say is that uh, all the players I, I worked with, all the clubs, were quite interesting characters. Mm. And if I went into detail of different incidents and, and, and things that I saw and knew and experienced, I don't think I would be sitting here talking too much longer. So I'd rather okay. leave it with that. If I, can, if I can swing it then, what differences do you, do you think there is between modern day footballers and footballers then? Do you think they were, I don't want to use the word down to earth, but they were almost more like us back then and maybe they're a little bit sheltered now? The, I think the almost... draw, in, in those days, footballers were characters and not necessarily, not necessarily um, great you know, role models, where, <clears throat> but they were in some respect. But today's footballers are a bit different because a lot of them don't have anything to do with the fans and don't want to bother with the fans and basically they're there for the money. Mm. And uh, um, you go back to Birch's time when he was a football player and got paid peanuts. And what they used to do for footballers, for their clubs in those days, where there was loyalty, where there was people playing because of the sport and because of the game, not because of the money. That's one set of football players. Mm. In the 90s, um, you know, you had to get players to do lots of community stuff, and they did. I don't think players of today are in that ilk. I don't think they give as much as they um, they did in the 90s. Mm. Even though they were characters, and some of them were characters, um, I think today's football players are a little bit more concerned about their money and cash, and, and yeah. then as soon as they finish, they shoot off home, whereas... The other football players, when in my time, or the clubs I work for, is stay behind and talk to people and go and do presentations and whatever. It's the different mentality people all through the the, the life of football. Hmm. I mean, I, I've, I've this... had. Oh, sorry, sorry, you. Go on. Sorry, I was, oh, just, on, I was just going to. I was going to get build on that a little bit. Like I've I've had Steve Walsh on. It was, it was a, a while ago. Like we had Steve Walsh on like last year, and. Um, he we mentioned he mentioned very briefly. I never really talked to him about it, but like you know the captains club where like was that kind of that like you said that that more what's the word i'm looking for like down to earth nature of it where because in the captain's club i'm right in thinking that some of the players would go in and meet fans and stuff like that before in like the 80s was that kind of what it was the used captain, for captain club was a restaurant um in the week and it was a it was a restaurant at the, on the match day the captain's club and the, the, the players had their own room if that's what you mean um Players would, would mingle and go out and about on a match day and talk and do presentations and that sort of thing. I'm not sure they do so much of it today. No. I think people are... I mean, we had a road to when Brian was... I, I use Brian as an example because Brian was better at managing the players to do things off the pitch, mm. whereas I don't think Martin was. And I certainly think um, Mark McGee was, was, was good. But Brian was at a, a way of making sure that all the players did community stuff, they, they did um, presentations, they met fans, they went to hospitals and all that sort of thing. He had a rotor system and he made people do it. When you get to the time when Martin was there, he wasn't quite as bothered about all that. Yeah, I think I think maybe that was, maybe that was, all, maybe it was kind of in Martin O'Neill's control, but maybe it was also out of his control because when Brian Little first took over, it was the early 90s. They weren't in the Premier League with all the glitz and the glam. Like, they were still quite a, like you said, like a spit and sawdust football club. Whereas by the late 90s, they, they delivered a lot of success. There were consecutive top 10 Premier League finishes. There was all the money and, and the, the furore about the Premier League. Maybe that was just the way football and society was changing that footballers weren't, maybe like kind of how it's got to now. 
footballers are celebrities now. They're not sports players, are they? Like that, maybe that's where that kind of change was starting to happen. Perhaps I don't know whether I'm defending him too much. Well, there. What I want to say to you that is that the more the football players are successful and the club, the more the players are more distant from their fans. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's. I think you're probably right. But we'll we'll end it on a reasonably positive note. So we'll. Uh, we'll I've got one more question for you, um, Barry. Um, overall. We were at the club for just shy of ten years, just shy of a decade. How would you summarise your time at Leicester? What would you, if you could do it in a nice, concise? Right, well, how how would you sum it up? I would say um, a challenge. It was certainly hard work. It was certainly turning a rundown football club into a success story. Um, it was certainly about introducing quality standards, value service and engaging with the community i think the people who work with me did a tremendous job in a very short space of time in turning that football club from nothing into something and you know we had a very good reputation in the football industry as a, as a football club leicester city for being innovative innovation innovative and uh, all the branding and all the marketing and the communication and looked after people every every aspect of community and every person in leicester knew about leicester city of time we'd finished what we were doing mm. and i think that really is um, you know all the awards that we won or all the things we achieved if I, if anybody said to me in 1991 you're going to do all that, that i wouldn't have believed them yeah honestly i think i think after reading your book like it was it was really sort of eye-opening to see all the work that went into taking the football club from where it was to, to I mean, unfortunately, I would say you kind of, it's difficult because you kind of want to say you laid the groundwork for what the club is now. In in terms of the stature of the club, I think maybe you laid the groundwork. But like you said, after you left, um, I say left, after you were kind of forced out, the club went back down before coming up again. But you definitely helped raise the the stature of the club for sure. Well, doing it with nothing, and we had no money in the pot, I think that 50 grand went a long, long way to take a club from nothing to 25 million and an 8 million commercial commercial turnover with a 3 million pound profit at the end of it. Mm. So the 50 grand I spent over those eight years, I think was well uh, well used. Yeah. I think yeah, um, you probably, it sounds like you raised the standards and you almost broke the glass ceiling that they seem to have above them. You showed them that it was possible to break that mould and start becoming a success by, like you say, gathering people around you who wanted to, who had that same vision, wanted to be successful in the same way you did, not just people who were kind of passive and uh, didn't work, not bothered. But, you definitely were right in that, so credit to you. We, we, we turned a one-day-a-week business, which is football, Saturday, or a one-night game, into a seven-day-a-week machine, a business machine. Yeah. Because it was open seven days a week from six in the morning to one or two o'clock in the next morning. Seven days a week that football club was. Yeah. Earning money off the field, off the back of match days and, you know, non-match days were the ones that... I mean, you imagine when I went there, the catering was about 100 grand. And, I took, and then when I left, it was three and a half million. When I, can you imagine the retail shop was about, I don't know, 200 grand. And when I left, it was nearly four million. And, yeah, wow. you know, all the other, I mean, Walker's Crisp came in at, when I first was there what, on £50,000 for the shirt. When I left, it was over a million. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how, you know, we made a lot of money for that club. And it was all all our money that we made. And the Carling stand made a lot of money as well because we paid for it in three years. All that was generating money to buy players. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing stuff, Barry. That, thank you so much for giving up your evening to join us on our on our podcast honestly i know there'll be a lot of less fans listening and, and other fans as well who will really love listening to the insight of the, the inner workings of a football club. if they want to know more buy me book <laughs> yeah one last plug uh oh, barry, barry honestly it's a pleasure to sit down and talk to you talk with you this evening like again thank you so much for for giving up your evening and uh yeah take, take care of yourself good luck with uh any other business ventures you've got so which I'm no sorry, doubt you'll become a you all, raging success I'm with as well. I'm sorry I can't tell you all the things that's, uh, that's libelous and slanderous because otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a lie, though, Barry. 
worth a try. <laughs> hey, to be, to be fair, we got some dirt on David Beckham, but unfortunately, I don't think he's going to listen to the podcast. So. No, I don't, I don't think he's <laughs> I think I think David Beckham wanted somewhere private to have a chat with his girlfriend. And that's the point <laughs> I want to oh, thanks, he gave her that Thank big you. hug, didn't he? He gave her that big hug. <laughs> well, oh, if that's yeah, what that... you call it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks again, Barry. Uh, take care of yourself and good luck. Thanks. To, nice to meet you both. Anyway, good luck with your programs and future programs. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much. We really do appreciate. Nice to meet it. you too. God bless. Take care. Bye bye. See you, Barry. Take care, bye. Oh, do you know what? Nice bloke. Like, I mean, I know yeah, like yeah. Le Leicester fans listening will probably be there'll be a lot of people disagreeing with a lot of stuff that was said because Barry is is unfortunately. And fortunately, kind of a controversial figure um, around. Obviously, like I said, it ended. It ended in on very sour terms. Like, and it's interesting because it's interesting to kind of see the other side of the to see the other side of the coin, isn't it? Like, a lot yeah. of the time you hear the players, you hear the managers, you hear the fans, but you know, managed to give him a platform to hopefully tell his side. And I don't know. Like, it's it's interesting. Some people won't be moved by it. Some people might. See it in I a different it, light. I but... think what's what's also interesting is I'm I'm obviously seeing this from a completely neutral point of view. Like I really am. I wouldn't necessarily know have known who Barry was before this mm. and before you obviously uh, got in touch, Jack. But I think when I think about directors we've had and the mm. conditions they've maybe had to work in and the people they've had to work with. I do kind of start thinking maybe there's more to it than we ever realise. And mm. I know there's a couple of people on a different podcast um, that I listen to, and UFC Matters, they've said that they used to deal with a man called Derek Lambias, for any Newcastle mm. fans who know who that is. And he was a Mike Ashley um, man. Mm. And at certain points, he was actually really engaging and he tried to, to break the mould a little bit and, and met with fans. But then it was just barriers up at every opportunity. And it sounds like Barry had the exact same yeah. problem at first, but he managed to break him down and he, he was determined to do what he felt was right, whereas some people aren't really that made that way. So they almost mm. back off and then they get a bit of a reputation. Then, they're then they become the, the, the stick, the, the thing that everyone wants to beat them with, with the big stick. It, it's, it's interesting, it really is. And I'm not so sure that if, if he can go away with all them accolades, which let's be honest, there are a few, that you mm. can call it a failed time. There was clearly issues, there was clearly problems, but it sounds like it was of other people's making that he's not going to back down on, he's not going to mm. hand it to anyone. And I've got to be honest, in that position, I'm not sure I'd be doing anything differently as, as a person. So, yeah, I do think it's interesting. And people will make their own views and make their own judgments. Yeah, yeah. Right, we've got probably about seven minutes now, so you better be, you better be good at this one. Uh, we've got time for... The, the main reason everyone's here, to be fair, everyone absolutely loves this, but we're going to play some uh, obscure footballer of the week. And I've got, oh, this this is a cracker, to be fair. I've got one for you afterwards as well. So don't think oh, you're you, you better get it quick because I'm keeping this. I've got it. If got it, you don't, save it. It for, save it for next week. Um, okay, so I'll start off. Uh, I was born. This, this is, sorry, I would say this is going to, the birthday is going to make it sound more difficult than it is. But this is a player that we both know. Um, I was born on the 7th of March, 1974, making me 49 years old. Right. And I was born in, and I've done it again, picked another place its name I can't pronounce, uh, Itazango, 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 in Argentina. Jesus, right, okay. Hmm. I made my debut in 1993, and... Uh, I finished my career at the same club in 2010. I made 474 career appearances, scoring 130 goals. I'm going to say someone, but I don't want to ruin it. Go for it. No, give it a try. Only because of the Argentina thing. It really is only because of the Argentina thing. But I'm thinking he, he he's a fair age. He played a long time. He was about a one in three, one in four, given his position. But I'm not sure it was as many as that, but he took three kicks. One from yeah. Michael there? No, 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 no. He didn't play in the Damn. Premier League. Oh. He didn't right, play in the Premier League. He, no, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. He's one of my favourite players, but I was just it was just <laughs> the 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 hints were leading me there. Go on then, keep going. Okay. Um I am currently the manager of um Paraguayan Premier Division Club Chero Porteño. Um, 
And when I that's, played, I was sure that's uh, that, Mega Amaron's old team. Maybe, maybe. Um, and I when I played, I was a centre forward. Okay, I have a feeling they might have just won the league, mm. or won I a played, cup, won something. I only played twenty-seven games in the Premier League, scoring six goals. Ugh. But I was I played for a Premier League club in London from 2002 to 2006. I went on loan to uh, Kelta and Lorca Deportiva. Okay. My most prolific yeah. stint was at Racing Club in Argentina, where I played 66 games and scored 29 goals. And the club I played for was Fulham. Argentine Fulham. Forward. Would you like me to give you the clue that will probably give it away? No, not yet. Do you have any others that make it a little bit, a little bit easier, but nothing much? Not really. Let's have a look at honors. Height, six foot two. Ah, okay. I won, I believe. The UEFA. Hang on. Uh, I won. I was one of the winners of the. 2002 UEFA Inter Toto Cup with this club in the Premier League. What the? I, I, I've only got one more clue that will actually. And he retired me. in 2010. Yeah. He literally played in the Premier League for four years, apparently, but only really played for two. And how many goals did he get? Uh, six. In 20 odd. 27. Um. Oh, see, I'll have probably seen him live. The likelihood is I'll probably see him live. Hmm. If he was playing in 2002. Yeah, you go on, go on. You're going to have to give me that clue. I was most famous when I played. Oh, for I know, I know. A... don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. Facundo Sava. Yeah, yeah, Facundo Sava. What player? I've it before, that <laughs> clue. I know what you're going to say. Are you going to say something about a mask? Black and white mask, yeah, yeah. Yes. Jesus, man, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Gee, I've, yeah, I've wanted yeah. to. I've wanted to use him for a while. He's been, he's been, he's been running wow. through my mind for a while. I thought he scored more goals than that, but you know how wrong. Yeah, was that? well, it felt like he did because he always got his mask out. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Right, we have got just enough time, but I'm gonna yeah. try and do okay, it. Okay. Right. Bit. So he was born in 1977. Mm-hmm. Um, he was born, um, in Terezniz. I think that's how you pronounce it in in France. And he's 45. He started his career at, I'm going to say this as it looks, US Mali Leroy. And he played for PSG reserve team in 1997, but didn't play for the first team. JJ Kocha. No. You're not you're not on bad lines though. No, he's Nigerian, isn't he? But I suppose he could have been born in France. What am I about? Uh, exactly, yeah, yeah. Bruno and Gotti. Um No. I, know, I love my old Bolton players, but that is no, but when you said JJ Koch, you were like, kind of. I was like, Bolton, Bolton's got to be it. No, do you know what, no, what my point Steve is? Steve Mabron. You, you'll see where I'm coming from with that. So um Jeremy Adley Adier. <laughs> no. No. He moved to Strasbourg. In 1998, and played there till 2003, and played 134 times and got eight goals. So he played Defender. a lot for Strasbourg. Defender or midfielder, I'm going to say, or a really bad striker. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna miss the next two out because I feel like Premier League clubs. Aren't they? So I'm not gonna say what they are. Sylvan Distan. No, in 2009, <laughs> he. Went to Aston Villa and only played nine times after he'd been to these two clubs and played in Europe for one. And I, I believe he may have even played in Europe for the other, but I'm not going to say any more than that yet. That'll, that'll hopefully be a clue that makes it a little bit easier. How many games did he play for Aston Villa? Nine. Hmm. But in three years, so he wasn't particularly highly thought of because I think he felt like he was just robbing a living. And he ended his career in the lower leagues of the English, like the, the EFL. By playing 21 games and scoring two goals for a team that wasn't far from where we went to university in York. Harrogate. No. No. 
I said not Brad. far, but it's it, it's not far. It isn't far. I'll leave that with you. He was six foot tall, and he represented an African country um, when he was playing internationally. Uh, Senegal, maybe? That would be a good guess. Senegal. Mm -hmm. Abel Xavier. No. He was Portuguese, I think, wasn't he? Did he play? Did this player play for Newcastle? Yeah. Okay, that narrows it down. <clears throat> I'm not I think with your, you with, your with yours, they've e with yours, they've either ever they've either played for Newcastle or Bolton. There's no, there's no <laughs> one else. It's just oh. names in my head. I actually had someone else, but I, I thought this one was quite interesting. Um, if I if I say the team near where we went to uni, yeah. Oh yeah, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll tell you if okay. you get it right. Yeah. Barnsley, no. Rotherham, no. Doncaster, yes. Play for Newcastle. Play for Villa. He was actually really well thought of by our fans. Played fifty-two times and um, scored a goal. But he was really, really well thought of. But he he left when realistically he shouldn't have done because his career nose dived after that, and he probably would have captained us in the championship. Um, was he a defender? Yeah. He was signed by Sam Allardyce for us. Oh, I keep thinking of a From a games. team who won UEFA Cup. What year? I couldn't tell you the exact year. Uh, sorry, uh, they didn't win the UEFA Cup. They um, came second. They were runners up to Valencia. Oh, I always Africa. thought they. Yeah. I keep thinking of players, but I'm like, oh no, that was Sunderland. Hmm. Uh, would say it's not Czech Tiote, is it? No, I can't, I won't, no. No. Do you want to say his position? Oh, 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 oh. No, maybe. Oh, was he? Did he play for you? We had a few African lads at that time. Mm. I'm going to throw it out there. I don't know if he played for you. So he. And this is one of those players that I kind of forget. I don't even remember him playing for Villa. I don't remember him like. You won't remember him playing for Villa or Doncaster. But, but I, I think. Habib Bay. What a sh well done, Jack. Get it. I, so he was one of them. He was one that I was like, there's so many players from that period yeah. where I'm like, could have played for both Sunderland or Newcastle. There's like, there's so many <laughs> like, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. Sunderland had a bit of an influx of like African players as well, didn't they at one point? Yeah, like, it's, we were, it's, I was, was a bit before them. They kind of did it early, like tens, if you know what I mean. Um, but it was, it was Marseille who we played for in Drogba's team. Hmm. He was the captain of that side as well. He was he was a very well thought of player, oh. but yeah, he left us. What what a fall off that is! Oh, massive fall off. He's actually doing really well in management now. He's he's I think he's Red Star Paris, isn't it? Look, see, I think it's Red Star Paris. He's uh, managing at the minute, and I think he might have just got them promoted. So, let's have a look. Yeah, he's only been there since twenty twenty one, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Twenty twenty two, twenty three. Came third, two points off the oh no, came third. Mm. Oh, so yeah, All right, nice. Well, hopefully, you got those a little bit quicker than we did because they were two stinkers, they were. Um, <laughs> like, but uh, yeah, I have a feeling the Newcastle band might get it a little bit quicker, yeah, but that's yeah. only because they'll have known him, they'll have remembered him, yeah, probably. I, mate, I was, I was, that was such a throwaway guess. My next it was one was good. Gonna, it my, away, my, yes. my next one was going to be like Naira and Nosworthy. And he, I don't think he ever played oh, no, for Newcastle. He definitely wasn't. Us. No, uh, he wasn't. Us. But, right. Um, yeah. So we are we are going to be back again next week. Um, what we I think what we're going to try and do. Next, I mean, again, we said last week when we were ending. Like, I think we're going to try and get a guest on of some sort next week. Um, but not confirmed yet who that's going to be. I'm going to be putting the feelers out this week. I've I've got a couple of irons in the fire. Uh, one 
that I really, really hope we can get in for next week. Um, that'll be exciting, a little bit like the one tonight. Um, so we'll see. Uh, we'll come up with, we'll, but we will be back next week. Um, so thank you once again for tuning in. Hopefully you enjoyed our uh, our chat and our special with uh, Barry Pierpoint, and hopefully you uh, played along with Obscure Football of the Week as well. We have gone well over, like always, but that's because we enjoy talking ballocks, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we're getting <laughs> yes. every week now. Jack it's going a regular oh. thing. That. Right. Uh, yeah, but we'll be back next week. So thank you very much for tuning in again, guys. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe on YouTube. Give us a five-star rating on Spotify because it really, really helps to get the podcast out there. Uh, retweet on Twitter, you know, share it with your mates, everything that, you know, you can do to help get us out there. But thank you very much once again, and we will be back next week. Cheers, guys. Thank you.